This session is called Writing from the Heart, Food Writing and Memories. The panel will discuss food writing as a genre and its evolution over time and explore its nuances as a form of storytelling and recording history and culture. Before we begin, a few things to keep in mind. Uh, please put your phones on silent. Uh, the loos are on my left and uh, tea and coffee and snacks at the back and um, the smoking area is on my right. Um, we also have um, two bookstores and a library pop-up for you all to check out um, after the session. Uh, we'll be taking questions at the end, so please wait for the mic to be passed to you before asking a question. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the day. Archana Pidithala is the author and publisher of the cookbooks Why Cook and Five Morsels of Love. She spent over a decade working in technology before quitting her project man product management job to recreate her grandmother's recipes and venture into writing and publishing. Krish Ashok is not a chef but cooks daily. He learned to cook from the women in his family who can make the perfectly fluffy idli without le lecturing people on lactobacilli and pH levels. He likes the scientific method Okay. <laughs> he likes the scientific method, not because it offers him the ability to bully people with knowledge, but because it confidently lets him say, I don't know, let me test it for myself. Sharanya Deepak is a writer and editor from and currently in New Delhi, India. She writes about food, language, the commodification of culture, and is currently writing more essays. She's an editor at Vittles, a food and culture publication based between the UK and India. Chef Thomas's passion for cooking began in his grandmother's kitchen in Kerala. Um, in 2022, he founded the Lokavore, a platform committed to championing a local in Indian food movement and doing good through food. It achieves this, this mission through thoughtful storytelling, organizing curated events and travel experiences. Our moderator for today is Elizabeth York. She is a chef turned food researcher, writer, and an advocate for sustainable food systems. She's a co-founder of Edible Issues, a collective that is fostering thought and conversation on the Indian food system, and the founder of Saving Grains, an upcycling food initiative inspired by the historically circular relationship between brewers and bakers. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Ishani. Um, it's really exciting to be here this Sunday afternoon. Um, and in such great company, whether on the panel or in the audience, um, so many familiar faces and writers and authors. And it's, um, yeah, it's a really wonderful uh, space to be in. So thank you for having us all. Uh, I think feeding people, whether through food or through words, is such a great responsibility. Um, it gives us such an incredible platform either to tell stories, um, to communicate, um, thoughts and ideas, to talk about things like politics, economics, science, things that we've like never, th ideas that we've maybe not able to put into words and how do we use food as a way to also communicate that. Um, there's a lot at play when we talk about feeding people through words especially, whether it's culture, politics, economics. Um, and how do we kind of talk, how do we use our words to communicate that in a healthy, sustainable, and meaningful way. So we have some wonderful folks today uh, to talk about food writing uh, in its various aspects and forms as it's growing in, in India. Um, and Ishani introduced our exciting panel. And I want to start with a very, um, a very simple question, I think, about the idea of food writing. Um, who, who is a food writer or who gets to be called a food writer and what is uh, food writing today? Is it, what is the genre uh, that, we are, uh, that we are talking about? Uh, and I'll start with Sharanya. Um, we've had multiple conversations, sorry, I have to look dead in the camera. We've had multiple conversations about uh, non-food food writing. Um, what do you think food writing is really and um, should the genre even exist? Hi, thank you for having me. And this is a bit like, it's a bit weird, like us here and then you there, we know each other in funny ways. But um, yeah, so, you know, for me, I don't consider myself a food writer, but for the last two years, I've been writing about food and like food adjacent things. So the, the genre has very much come to me from other folks, from editors or from like the 
the need to have to categorize writing for the sake of, you know, an algorithm or the industry and things like that. So I do think that, well, I think food writing itself, like people who have expertise in food, like, or everybody else except me <laughs> in the panel, um, it does exist. And I think, you know, like cooking and the science of cooking and all of that does require a certain amount of, I guess, like existence within or like thinking about food in a, like constantly. For me, it was more um, like the kind of journeys of food before it reaches the plate or the idea of the market, because I don't cook that. I mean, I do cook, but I cook like fried rice four times a week, you know? So it's not like, so I'm not, I'm not very, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't have like a great taste pyramid going on. So for me, it was very much to do with the market and ingredients and things like that. I think like all writing, I think a food writing itself is also expansive and doesn't restrict itself to the idea of like some kind, a very specific kind of expertise, um, then it grows. And um, then, you know, there's more to think about within it. So for me, it has to do with housing and agriculture and, you know, gender and politics and all that. Like those are all lofty things, but like very much every day it manifests in all of those ways. So um, I don't know if I'm on a tangent, but I like to think about it in kind of like dynamic ways. So food is essentially part of the story and not the whole story itself. And because I don't have that many um, standards for taste, you know, for me, it never is really about the dish. Uh, because I don't, it doesn't, for me, it's always kind of good or spicy or like, it's just kind of basic. My taste uh, things are like quite basic. So it just becomes about everything else. So that's kind of how I've approached it. Yeah. Um, Archana, so everyone eats, some of us, uh, maybe not Charanya, uh, love to cook, um, but, and our families do have recipes and uh, different food cultures that we love to document and share, but who do you think gets to be a food writer today? Do you feel that the space of food writing, uh, especially in terms of recipe documentation, is somewhat gatekept? Mm. Um, it's always... You know, I, I, I got into food writing by accident. Um, my grandmother left behind a book from 1974, and that's my journey into this world totally by accident. Um, and I always hesitate when, you know, gatekeeping comes into any, any world. Uh, and, you know, 12, 13 years ago, when I was beginning to translate my grandmother's book, if somebody had told me, oh, well, you didn't, you don't, I, I didn't know how to cook when I started writing the cookbook. Um, so if somebody were to tell me at that point, uh, you didn't go to culinary school or you don't know how to cook or, you know, what's your background in writing? I don't have an MFA in writing or, you know, I don't have any fancy degrees that qualify me as a food writer. Um, so gatekeeping as a, as a thing just makes me uncomfortable. And if there was gatekeeping, I wouldn't have been a food writer, I guess. Um, um, and, you know, um, Anybody can talk about food. If, if it comes from a place of honesty, we all eat. Um, you know, it's it's something we consume every day. Um, it's it's something that, for me at least, it's 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 my work and life. And there's this kind of no boundary between work and life at this point in time. Um, it's how I live. What I share is how I live. Um, and it's also opened my eyes to a whole range of issues, uh, whether it's about the environment or ecology or just human existence. Um, it's, you know, my, my view to the world has been food. My worldview has been shaped by food and I've been shaped as an individual by food for the past 10 years. Um, yeah, I don't think I believe in gatekeepers or gatekeeping as a thing for anybody to experiment, explore. If it's coming from a place of honesty, if it's coming from a place of making this world better, um, anybody can do it. Um, Krish, I think uh, food science writing is something, especially in the Indian context, I think it's been very new. I think Masala Love has been uh, one of the very interesting books that have been out there on Indian food science writing. What is, through your experience writing that, what, has, what have you felt the Indian writing scene in the food science space, what has that looked like? And how has this been interesting, uh, especially on a digital, in the digital realm? So, uh, you know, as a, as a basically a tech bro 
who in the current world is generally known for wading into any subject they want to, right? And, and suddenly becoming an expert at whatever they want to do. Uh, I, I just had the modicum, the slightest modicum of self-awareness that I didn't want to be the sort of person who comes and says, hey, this is science, this is the right way. That your grandmother is wrong and you're, you know, all those people who know, actually know how to cook, that they're wrong, right? So I think the, uh, the reason for me to actually pick up food as the vehicle for explaining science rather than the other way around was, again, largely because the only three things that I could genuinely talk about were either software or music or food because I was eating food every day and I was cooking every day. Um, and so it just turned out to be the one that my publisher said, yeah, we did some market research. Nobody's written about the science of cooking, so why, let's do that, right? Uh, so in a sense, it was completely serendipitous in that sense. But what I found incidentally, uh, rather unsurprisingly, is the fact that science and cooking sort of sit very uncomfortably together uh, in India. Um, in a sense that on the one hand, most of our most of our cooking traditions, most of the actual people who cook, incidentally, use heuristics that are and shortcuts and ways in which they get things done. They're all grounded in in science, right? Part of the entire book, you know, Masala Lab was about saying was not about saying that your your mother was wrong. This is how to do it, but your your grandmother was right. This is how you measure rice, uh, the water amount for rice, and not by saying one is to two as your re internet recipes might but her method is better because it accounts for evaporation and so on, right? So the idea was to apply science to explain why practical traditional heuristics actually work. Whereas internet, WhatsApp, Uncle G is saying, uh, this will cure uh, COVID, that is good for throat and all of that. That is, you know, that is pseudoscience, right? So in a weird way, I think what has happened is that um, the internet avatar of the book has sort of taken off on a... Uh, this is something that is questioning our, our ancient traditions uh, and so on, when it's not really the case, right? So um, in a sense, I think this very nascent space when it comes to food writing in India, and it also comes from the fact that um, Indian cooking is also famously something that you can adapt all the time. I'm, I'm sure the experts are here, you guys are both chefs, right? In the sense that you can change as you go along, you can adjust the flavors, you can adjust textures. There are no fixed recipes. You can just sort of, you know, figure your way and just make make flavors, make new textures along the way. It's not like baking where if you, unless you get everything absolutely right, one shot goes in the oven, it comes out right, right? Um, so baking is sort of like more science, science friendly. So uh, there's a lot of the science writing, you know, Kenji Lopez and, you know, Harold McGee and so on. Um, I recognize that that's not the sort of rigid approach you can actually take to writing about the science where the science should actually help you liberate yourself um, and be more free uh, to do what you want rather than that. So that's been my journey at least. Thanks, Krish. Um, Thomas, I remember reading, so when I was in culinary school, Thomas was doing this exploration of Europe and was blogging about it and it was really interesting to like keep up with that and read about that. And now also progressively through the years, see the locovore, which is a, also a very different form of writing that has uh, taken, taken shape. Um, how have you seen the scope of food writing, especially especially from a culinary lens, uh, change over the last decade or so? Um, I think the way I got into and and um, the editor for the Loco Yamni is sitting right here, so I want to acknowledge her presence because I'll probably be referring to her a little bit here and there. Um, I think I got into uh, food writing. Uh, in a very different way where I was trying to, I mean, we, we very seldom use the word uh, or the phrase food, writer, food writing. We say food storytelling. And I think there's a distinction there in how we look at it, where we're looking to bring out stories that have a point of view uh, that's purposeful and intentional in a lot of ways. Um, and for me, I mean, getting into the space, I. I got interested in regional Indian food and the stories around food in India through my travels across the country. I've now visited about 26 states in the country exploring food over the last 10 years. And um, increasingly I saw that a lot of those stories uh, didn't make their way into mainstream narratives around Indian food. Um, a lot of those stories weren't uh, heard enough. And, and so for me starting out, um, I was trying to, in a way, 
be a storyteller through social media and through the format of uh, the menu at the Bombay Canteen. But uh, increasingly, I realized that, you know, that may not be... Um, I mean, I, I wanted to figure how we could make an in intervention into these food systems and these stories in a more impactful way that actually um, translates to some change. And that's how kind of the local came about. Um, but to answer your question, I think um, in, in general, I, I, I see that, uh, I mean, there are different aspects of food writing that exists in India especially. And what has happened is uh, while I think food writing in, in a very um, journalistic sense has remained more or less a constant. Uh, with social media, there's been a democratization of food storytelling, of food writing. Uh, and again, I, I keep going back to storytelling as a means where, you know, people are using different mediums like uh, Krish's, right? Um, and that means that it's not just the experts or the experienced writers or people who have culinary background who get to tell these stories. And there are stories that are out there which uh, may not have experienced storytellers to tell them. So I think that's what we're seeing now where, uh, and, and that's what we are trying to do at the local war is to, how do we bring some of those storytellers to the forefront uh, when they have interesting stories to tell? I also wonder on storytelling, uh, I think cookbooks have been a way for us to uh, cook stories uh, or like envision ourselves in spaces where we can recreate and then go on to create our own stories, but also through the food we're cooking, learn about other people's stories. Um, Archana, how do you, how do you think, what does storytelling in that recipe format uh, mean to you? Um, and how are you keen to see more people tell these food stories? Um, I think I just want to like take a step back for a minute and go back to what Sharanya mentioned right at the beginning of this session. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of writing that can be classified as food writing. Uh, cookbooks are just one aspect of, of this big umbrella that I can see. Uh, there's obviously journalistic writing. There's the kind of very specific writing that Sharanya does, uh, where you know you're looking at political issues, you're looking at socio-cultural issues, you're looking at famine, you're looking at you know what kind of restrictive eating that's seeping into our society today. So there's, I think there's the, the scope of food writing is very vast, um, and you know right from seeds farmers, you know how is how is the food traveling to our plate and what happens to waste. I think that that scope is very, very large and, and cookbooks are, I would think, uh, uh, kind of a piece of the bigger aspect of food. Um, and with my, obviously I got into food writing because of my grandmother's recipes. So, um, you know, I do believe in the power of a recipe as such. Um, and, you know, can a recipe change um, our existence? And by that, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think about small details when I'm cooking, like I worry about uh, where that mustard seed popping in my tarka has come, come from, you know, what, what material my pan is made from, am I being efficient in cooking, like am I being energy efficient when I'm cooking, uh, am I being, um, you know, am I just using one pan so there's less to wash up after, so there's, there's a whole, and what is the soap I'm using to wash that dish, so it just becomes... Uh, more than just what the recipe holds. And when I try to write a recipe, I try to kind of not be didactic about this or not to be pedagogical about this, but there's some of that seeps into when I write, when I write a recipe. It's just not very instructional of point one, two, three, four, but you know, what's, what's the pan you're using? What's the most heat efficient way to do this? All of that is built into the recipe. So there's this story, there's a story that's already seeped into that recipe. Um, you know, a lot of the kind of writing I do specifically, specifically gets bucketed as autobiographical writing. Um, and this, you know, we can, we can discuss till the cows come home about whether that's required or not in today's world. Uh, but what I try to do, at least with my second book, where, where the storytelling is probably wider than just the recipe itself. Uh, you know, the people who cook and, uh, you know, what is their motivation to cook? Uh, and a lot of times I see that people who cook are also people who care about the environment the most. 
something about cooking really leads you on that path of being more conscious, of being more minimal, of being more, um, you know, just to be more a more meaningful human being somehow. Um, and that's what I've tried to do with with my second book uh, is to, you know, all these things I'm talking about, where is my food coming from? Like if we if we think about Molly's story from the Timbuktu Collective, or if I think about Vishala's story from the Buffalo Back Collective, all of those stories are, are stories about recipes, sure. Like Vishala shares her grandmother's recipes. Uh, Molly shares recipes from one of the caretakers at Timbuktu. So there are recipes, but I think the story is larger. You know, why do, uh, why do we... Um, and for me, food has been a way to share these stories with the world. I don't know if I answered your question. Maybe I, I've tried to, uh, you know, the, for me, both are important. The recipe is important. The, res the writing of the recipe is important because I don't look at it as an instructional manual. I don't look at it as a way of telling it in five different points. Um, and who cooks it? Why they cook it? Uh, you know, is, is, this make, is this recipe making this world a better place? All those are important yeah. as well. Can a recipe change our existence? I, yeah. I totally believe in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so moving on from um, a recipe to, I think, Sharanya, when you tell like these larger stories uh, of food um, and when we're writing, when you are writing about it, I think one, uh, something that we've heard over the last couple of years is no one reads anymore especially when it comes to food, food stories. I think everyone was consuming content or consuming food through reels and through, you know, shorter forms of content. So how do you think uh, this kind of food writing or the writing you do um, is changing? Or how would you see this kind of food storytelling? How do you see this kind of food storytelling today and in the future? <laughs> so... You know, you know, you know more than anybody that I kind of disappear when I finish my work. Like, did someone could like bring up something I wrote two years ago, and I'd be like, I don't even, I have no idea what they're talking about. But um, you know, like to me, I'm a writer. I'm not a food writer. I'm not anybody else. Like that's if I had to really identify with something. So to tell a writer that they have to condense themselves into six hundred words is just like the meanest thing to do to a person. And it happens, and it happens quite a lot. When I take a page and they'll be like, oh, this, this will be good in like 450 words. But, and I used to do all of that. And now I think I'm lucky to be at a point in my sort of like writing career that I can write long form. And um, it's just all I want to do. And, you know, I feel like, like this story I wrote about um, rice in Goa, which is about kazans, which are like swamplands where saline resistant rice is farmed. And I went into this whole story knowing nothing. It was like, I literally went in like an American abroad, kind of like literally zero, like no ground, like, you know, and so everything was new to me. So everything I wanted to tell people. Um, I found out about like little ecosystems that didn't know existed. I was like a full like Delhi person in Goa, just rambling about on my bike, you know. So all of that kind of made it into my draft. And I feel like people went along with it because it was also kind of like a surprising big story about something that was crucial, that I didn't know was crucial. I didn't know how crucial it was to farm in uh, places with salt influx, but it's like, it's the future, you know? So um, so I do think there's a space for it, but like, I don't want to get really pedantic and say everyone should sit down and read 5,000 words all the time. Like, I know it's not, that's just not how things work and like people are busy and, you know, so there's... And more than anything, I feel like all of these different forms can come together to really form this really rich kind of dynamic world that we're in right now. That is happening. When I started food writing, which was in 2016, I started because I was reading Roads and Kingdoms, which is fairly new then, which is a magazine that was started by Anthony Bodin and um, two of his partners. And, you know, I just wanted to be like, it was, I just wanted to be a traveler on the road and like have this kind of like have exactly the life that they had. I was really enamored of them. And um, so for me, I went into it to be able to tell about other things. And I think food is a way to get to other stories as well, like tell about diaspora and tell about housing and movement and migration. And the greatest thing about food writing is that it it's taken that in its swing and it's like, it's happened. Like music writing, for example, is still stagnant. You know, it doesn't really... I feel like music writing has huge scope, but has never really gone there. And food writing is growing and growing because of the amount of people that feel like they can enter. So, um, but that said, obviously there's a lot of like hierarchy at play. 
um, in the, like globally, editors tend to be of a certain demographic. In India, editors and everybody, and you know, writers tend to be of a certain demographic. So there's like a lot of work to do. But I feel like it's more sort of I don't know if it's as like open is the word, but it's more kind of like fluid, and you know, things can go either um, way. And there's more place for there's more place for not combat, but like bringing in another another point of view. Um, yeah, I do wish people did read more long form though. I'm just slipping it in, <laughs> slipping it into the van. Yeah. Um, Krish, the lot of the storytelling you do is uh, is a way where I think is is a lot of culture storytelling, but through science. What has that journey been like for you? So, um, yeah. So this is a. Uh, as I was, t I was just telling someone just before this uh, talk that uh, that um, I essentially got onto Instagram primarily to promote the book. I, I was not really an Instagram person, right? Uh, because my publisher said that you got to be on Instagram. That's where all the food people are. All this Twitter and all, people will just say lots of things. Nobody buys anything. People are there on Twitter only to fight and posture, not really buy. See, click on a single link, nobody will do that, right? In fact, even if Twitter says that. Please, before you click share this, have you actually clicked on this link? You know, now Twitter now has this warning, right? So, in a sense, I think uh, uh, I was a reluctant enter into this this world, um, and it's interesting. I was sort of reflecting back to some of the things that Archana and, and, and Charanya said. Um, to me, actually, um, uh, everything is is some form of writing. It doesn't really matter. I, I think we we have a tendency to glorify long form writing as as. Uh, as but I will say this, um, if people believe that people used to read long form, long form before and nowadays they don't read. Um, if Instagram Reels existed 10 years ago, people wouldn't have read long form. They would have watched Reels then too, right? I think we have to recognize that there was a scarcity of other kinds of uh, uh, media. And so people consumed what was available, right? And I think in a sense, I've always seen writing as a, um, everything is writing, right? So even an Instagram Reel, I write a thousand words, and then I exercise my editorial creativity to get it down to the 233 words that I can cram into 90 seconds at my uh, pace of speaking. Um, so that's an editorial choice. Um, and then I also have to figure out what to leave out, what not to leave out, and then, then remove useless things like prepositions, adjectives, uh, and all these other uh, full stops, commas, and pauses, and so on, because that's what the, you, know, you want to cram as much information as you can. Um, this, this is just new ways of writing, right? So in that sense, um, even if you're making a video, a long form video, even a movie starts off with writing. I mean, a screenplay is, has to be entirely written. You have to describe exactly what transition you want, what happens when. So in that sense, I think every form of writing is just writing, right? Um, there's a certain, there's a certain beauty to long form writing where you can just, uh, get into the nuance of a subject a little bit more than other things. And I think that's great, but. Uh, I don't think we should glorify that over other forms of writing, um, if you will. And to be honest, in my experience, what has happened is that um, as someone who started first doing, well, wrote the book, 65,000 words, science of cooking and so on, and then um, you know, writing a column for Mint on the you know, weekly, this thing where they said 800 words, you know, not more, uh, and so on. So that was the limit. So I used to get around the word limit by doing illustrations and then cramming in a lot of text into those illustrations, right? So that was the way you know, to get past that. Um, and then, well, that had, if you really think about it, even your online um, probably has a slightly larger audience than the number of people who actually buy books in India. But then once you get to something like social media, your audience size is now 3 million, 4 million people, right? So in that sense, I think um, it's, it's, a, it, it's bizarre. A lot of people who watch my Instagram videos, many of them don't know I've written a book. So it's like, you know, they just see me as someone who will debunk some myths and they'll ask me questions. Oh, bro, is broiler chicken safe? Is it okay to eat? No matter what I do every day, there'll be the same questions that people keep asking again. Um, and I won't be surprised if the next way of thinking about writing this is to train my own chat GPT like large language model to answer on my behalf to the people based on all the writings they've already done, you know, please answer all of these questions and so on. So I think the journey of writing about science in um, in itself definitely has to go down the mass medium route rather than the uh, long, particularly in science. Because I think um, people cannot be reading 2000 words to understand the science of something. 
um, they want a quick visual metaphor that they can understand in simple terms um, and then slowly uh, get an appreciation for what science might be or what the scientific method might be. And so that I think is, is really what I would say is where at least science communication per se needs to focus on short form media as more interactive, visual, you know, in the future, maybe all the other tech bro terms like AI, metaverse and all of those things as well. Yeah, you mentioned writing, say, a thousand words and then bringing it down to about 200. And I think um, the next part of this conversation, I'm very interested to talk about uh, research process and documentation when it comes to writing. Because a lot of food, I mean, food is very personal. Um, a lot of the times they aren't our stories. Uh, and we are communicating and we're, we're sharing about them. Um, and this is, I think, to all four of you. How do you navigate through this process of food research and writing, uh, especially when it's uh, difficult conversations like uh, famine or um, food is food when a lot of food comes with a baggage of shame? Um, or, uh, and how do we, how, wh what is something that you've learned maybe throughout your journey or how do you go about uh, telling stories that sometimes aren't yours to tell? Um, Sharanya, would you like to start us off? Because I know you did some very interesting work um, in Rajasthan last year with Serendipity as part of the food lab residency. And those were hard stories to tell on famine and food. Yeah, they were hard, and uh, they. I think like, and right after the, right before that, I reported something on vegetarianism and like the kind of supremacy of, you know, uh, the idea of vegetarianism on in, in India, and I did them both back to back. And I think by the end of it, I was like, I, I really didn't know what I was um, getting into at the time. But um, you know, it's a, it's a very hard thing, and I try to. And early on, there's some work that I've done that I'm not proud of at the moment. Uh, it's definitely, I can like, go back and be like, I wouldn't have done that if I wasn't. You know, I was, when I started off, I was young, I was starting off, I was almost like, it's a hyper competitive industry, cooking, journalism, writing, everything. So everyone, I was in this mode of like, kind of trying to climb over other people to get a pitch in, you know, and um, if it wasn't this competitive, I feel like, like, I definitely agree with um, Krish when that like, you know, long form writing definitely shouldn't be glorified. But one thing that happens is that because it takes a long time to produce, oftentimes you can think about the nature of the work you're putting out. So unlike people, unlike my colleagues who work in the news or like work in quick kind of turnarounds, I work on the same thing for about six to seven months. So I can kind of go back and be like, this entire story is not my place to tell and it needs to go, you know, or I can like back out of projects entirely, which... I wish in the industry there was space to do because sometimes like two months into reporting, I've just been like, okay, this is just not something I should be doing or this is not something that I should tell. And I think there's a kind of, there's like a rule in anthropology or something that I read uh, online about, um, it's like during a long project, if you keep asking yourself whether you should be doing it and the answers again and again, it's like, oh, don't know or no, then you should probably just abandon it because it's not your place to do. And obviously you have to like reckon through, is it, how necessary is it and like you know how important is it that it, this goes out in this political environment constantly you have to think about how safe you're keeping your subjects or your sources um also in the case of the fa famine stories in bengal and then in rajasthan that i did for me it was they were not my stories at all so very much i was like you know are people going to sort of like is this my place to be telling these people's stories? So for Bengal, I had a rule where I was like, no pictures of starvation and no kind of like gory images, which is the way that the Bengal famine is always portrayed is, is always in the place of, like always in the way of starving bodies and essentially kind of like victimhood. Um, so for me, it was really important to kind of bring out stories of survival and like how people pass things on. Um, that story itself took about 11 months for me to do, I think it was about a year and me and Alex, my editor went back and forth, back and forth, you know, there was disagreements, Ameri the American team wanted me to tell more catchy things. And I was like, there's no way I can do that. Like, I can't just like tell a story about intense poverty because you think it's going to get more clicks. But all of this is because I had a choice at the time because it was not something, it, it was something that I had time to produce. So it was things I can, I could reckon with. I think there's a great responsibility when the people are not like when they're not your stories, I try to go back to do at least two kind of fact checks with my subjects. So I either call or go back on field 
and show and and show people what I'm putting out. Um, with the famine stories, I think it's really important to think about agency um, and not. You know, I feel like it's such a tricky thing because resilience is always kind of commodified as like, oh, you know, South Asians are like South Asians are really resilient people. They will rise up. Marginalized people are resilient. They will, and then ignoring all the things that kind of work towards marginalizing people, you know, constantly. So I think it's like a, for me, I try to try to figure out how to give like value to the voices that are that I'm interviewing, as well as not just disappear the forces that impose these conditions on people. Uh, it's very tricky. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or doing a good job. But um, yeah, it's definitely a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, at the Locovore as well, you do tell partner producer stories, you tell stories of the food system. Uh, how do you and how do you and Yamini like navigate through this process of how do you choose whose story is more important than the others or which producer um, has a more worthy story to tell? I think uh, like Sharanya said, it's it's a really challenging and tricky area to navigate for both Yamini and I as we uh, think about this. I mean, the, the disclaimer here is that the local world is really young. We're only a little over a year old, and we see ourselves as still learning and growing and evolving as a platform to understand like, what is our place in this world of storytelling. Um, but if I can like, give you an example, not of a producer, food producer, but uh, we did a story on uh, Vamsi Mata, who uh, is a theater artist, uh, for those of you who are not aware, who... Um, and he, he does a play called Come Eat With Me, where he's trying to, it's an interactive play where he gets the audience to partake in the process where he's telling his story of um, his, his childhood, the stories of caste and oppression through the medium of food. Um, and um, we actually just asked him, like, who do you want, who do you think should tell your story? Um, and he suggested a writer called uh, Rahi Punyashloka, who did a terrific job. Um, so I think it's also um, being conscious of um, whose who's story and who can tell the story in a way that uh, someone can do the most justice to it. Um, is is something that we we're constantly thinking about that. And like Sharanya said, I don't think I don't, there are no answers for this. There are no right ways to do it. We try and make sure for our stories to get permission, um, to, to give due credit. Um, we actually did a very exciting piece which just recently got published um, on Russell Market where uh, about 10 to 12 of us, including Pankuri who's here, uh, we have a series on the local work called Market Archives. And um, we, 10 to 12 of us, mix of researchers, photographers, uh, food writers, chefs, uh, went to the market to document it and archive it. Um, that piece took us eight months to put out. We went in November and it just got published last week. Um, but we wanted to again, and it's a three-part series, because we're talking about the market, we're talking about um, the architecture and the history of it, but also about the people. And um, Pankuri actually reached out a few days ago and said, you know, it'll be really nice to print this out and maybe like uh, go to the, go back to the market and show the people whose stories we told uh, and maybe give them a copy, uh, make them a part of the uh, story. Um, so again, for us, uh, our stories live beyond the screen, live beyond what we publish. Um, we, I mean... Sharanya spoke about how she doesn't remember pieces she wrote years ago. Uh, almost exactly a year ago, she wrote a beautiful piece for the Lokovo called A New Appetite for the Old Grain about uh, um, millets. And um, now we have an entire project that's focused on, you know, millets, where we have a lot of research that's going into it. We have, we have a separate team of researchers. We have uh, volunteers who are testing out recipes. Um, and we're trying to approach, again, so then we're approaching that, that aspect of food writing from a multi-dimensional way of uh, actually spending time on it. Um, and I think we're we lucky in that sense as a platform where we don't have the pressure of deadlines. We don't have someone looming over us to say, you know, this many pieces per month. Um, 
and uh, we don't take them for granted. Archana, as you, uh, your, through your work, uh, your stories of food come to life through recipes and through cooking. And I think why cook has been very interesting because as you mentioned, they go beyond uh, telling just, the, go beyond just highlighting just the recipe, but into the story of people. What has this research writing and documentation process been like for you? So I don't come with journalistic training. So I was very wary when I had the responsibility of telling other people's stories. Even though, you know, these are people I've known for many, many years. Like my mother is a part of Why Cook. Um, but also there are newer friends. But it's it's been a mix of, you know, friendships formed over, over many years. Uh, but I did feel the weight of the responsibility, even though I knew all of them who are a part of the book very, very well. Um, and I interviewed all of them. And I have no skills in how to interview people. So I would have these long conversations and some of these, you know, when I was transcribing them all over again, uh, they're like five, six hours long, some of these conversations. Um, and, you know, I kind of sat and typed out because I didn't know what else to do. Like, I didn't know what software would actually translate these conversations into text. So I would listen and like type and it was it was nice to be able to hear those voices again. Um, and one of the choices I made with Waikook was to tell these stories in third person, although, you know, I know all of them very well. I chose to remove myself from, from storytelling. Uh, and I wanted the focus to be on the person who is a part of the story. And I'm completely invisible when you, when you read the story. It's, it's, it's told in third person, including my own mother's story is told in third person. Um, yeah, I think, um, there are no good answers. I have figured this out along the way. Um, and, you know, uh, the average length of the story of each person in Y Cook is about 1,000 words. Um, and I had like sometimes 15, 16,000 words that I was trying to, and these are life stories. So I was just not talking about a moment in time. I was trying to compress life stories into like 1,000 words. Um, uh, yeah, so I think I made some choices of uh, of uh, of being true to what people were telling me uh, to do it with honesty, to not to not uh, interfere with the story, to be absent, like for me to be absent from the story completely, um, and to just to just to be as true to the story as possible. And you know, some of these life situations were changing. Like I interviewed everybody in twenty nineteen, early twenty twenty, and the pandemic hit and everything shut. And some of the life situations of people who are interviewed had changed over a period of time. So, you know, it was, it was, I really, you know, I had sleepless nights when, you know, I think the kind of work Sharanya does is much more, uh, you know, much more difficult. Uh, for me, I was still dealing with friends. Like I was still dealing with people I know very well. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's harder, I think, when you're getting into an unknown territory, like, like what Sharanya does, for instance. Uh, but I still had sleepless nights, nights, even if I was talking about something very familiar to me, some, you know, people, like we, we were writing about people who are very familiar to me. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, the biggest thing, and, and my editor, Sonia, held me to it through the process. Uh, you know, she can catch a lie from a mile. Um, you know, I, I trust Sonia's eyes more than mine. So the minute something on the page appears like, you know, I'm, I'm faking it, she'll catch it. So I'm very conscious of the fact that, uh, you know, Sonia is going to read it and edit it. So, you know, that, that honesty is already built into before I send the piece out to her, you know, for her to read. Um, yeah, I think it was... Uh, also having Sonia as my editor across two books. So she's seen me write over 10 years and it's also been a very creative partnership and we fight over commerce and semicolons and I believe they're absolutely important. Um, you know, we, we argue about things at length. Uh, but I think it, it, at the end of the day, as long as it's, it's done from a point of uh, wanting to tell a good story and wanting to tell it the right way and wanting to tell it with honesty, I think, I think that's one way to start. Thank you. You mentioned, uh, like, especially over the last couple of years, things have changed so much. Um, uh, food changes, food, the, the way food and our food system changes is rapid. 
um and krishi work with food science and we have uh, new information uh, coming out every day in terms of uh, how compositions of what we eat how we eat what was that research and uh, documentation process like for you while you were building masala lab and how did you again coming back to the reels how do you choose what facts to keep in or what facts to keep out what content to put out there that's a, that's that's a really hard question so masala lab per se was actually simpler because it was my notes from the last 15 16 years of uh, cooking um again as someone with the generally terrible memory for facts um i tend to try and break it down to first principles note down everything uh, only then will i remember right so i can't remember abstract facts i i need it to be at the level of what's happening at the molecular level and then i can you know build it all the way up so i just got into the habit of writing down you know oh today i use 80% hydration in my chapati so it was okay and, and then you know 70% was too dry and so on so that's essentially uh masala lab came out of all of those notes for the most part uh again as i said the harder thing about masala lab was what to leave out uh because the publisher is like it's got to be 250 pages uh, can't be a 500 page textbook nobody will buy it. so it's got to be paperback it's got to be 250 pages we're in the middle of a pandemic um so you know it has to be snappy and so on so again um the choice was to say what are the most common things indians do we cook rice you know we we cook meat protein seafood we cook you know cook wheat make breads make gravies you know dry dishes um and that's it you know that's really all you can cover right i mean can't do deserts and snacks and all the the universe and again necessarily it also has to leave out some of the amazing things that we discover from you know these acts journeys around india the northeast and some of these other uh, foods that that otherwise are not part of the mainstream at all right so it's still at end of the day you still have to deal with biryani butter chicken and chetty nad chicken curry to some level because that's really what you know what people want to read about so that is the masala lab story the for me the the interesting thing about uh, the reels essentially is has to do with recognizing that um the most important element of storytelling there uh is data so what i found out is that counterintuitive data is usually almost always the best way to uh, tell stories i'll give you an example right uh, regularly one of my favorite pet subjects tends to be eggs uh it usually along the lines of hey you know eggs should really be vegetarian they're not really non vegetarian and you'd be surprised by the number of people who disagree with that right saying that no 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 and then the reason they disagree with it is because you know hey if you if you let a egg egg sit around it will hatch into a chicken because there is a baby chicken inside um i know sex education is pretty poor in india but recognize that poultry sex education is also pretty poor in india people don't realize that it's actually an unfertilized egg and so on so that aside the more interesting data related question way of thinking about that is that i'm not going to convince people that egg is vegetarian that's not the point at all it's cultural you grew up not eating it you're not going to eat it right so that's you can't really change people's minds but one other way of looking at it was to say something like uh, you know something if you're a agricultural laborer right um for you tur dal is 120 kg 100 100 rupees a kg uh, roughly right approximately i just checked the amazon price maybe he gets cheap let's assume 100 rupees um in a kg there's about 150 grams of protein okay so that's what he's paying 100 rupees for 150 grams of plant protein right um but if he has a few chickens running around his house uh, cost of his protein is zero right because the uh, the chickens actually well they reproduce and by the way you don't have to feed them they actually feed off agricultural waste so the deeper story there is the fact that actual animal husbandry evolved as a side activity to plant grain based agriculture so that because 99% of what you produce in grain based agriculture is waste because we only eat the white part of the rice the white part of the wheat all the rest of the plant is just waste so humans domesticated cows and goats and all these other things that basically eat that and turn that into protein while well, some of them do labor that's essentially how agricultural systems originated right of course industrial poultry all of that is ethically problematic and so on but i think you know uh, for me a lot of people were surprised when they recognized that ha huh, if i actually have goats and chickens running around my house for me if i were a poor person that's free protein tur dal is not free protein right so in a sense i think recognizing that data is actually a very counterintuitive way to uh, tell stories of course we all have our biases you can cherry pick data all that is possible right so you know the other example is that uh, people will say uh, a lot of activists will come and say that animal you know eating meat is unsustainable for the planet absolutely true for the west but again what is the data what are the greenhouse gas data for india 
particular, it was only 14% of greenhouse gas emissions in India is from agriculture. And within that, 8% is dairy cows. That's the big portion, right? Nobody considers that a problem, right? 4% is rice. Animal husband, actual animal husbandry for meat doesn't even register because the per capita consumption of all of that is so tiny that most Indians are effectively either vegetarian or vegan, particularly in South India. Right? So in that sense, I think sometimes data is actually a very powerfully counterintuitive way of actually telling these stories. Thank you, Krish. Um, on that note, I'd love to open up uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so if we can take uh, a couple of questions. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand and we can bring the mic around. Hi, um, thank you so much. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, thank you so much for this. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, I think all four of you are doing this phenomenal, phenomenal job, which in reference to the last thing you said, Krish, about setting context for South Asians, right? Um, it's something, as someone in the industry, I have consistently struggled to understand, which is that so much of the data we're thrown towards us on the internet and around uh, is not reference to the subcontinent at all. Um, is that something that drives all of you? And I mean, this question could be to anybody who feels like answering. Uh, all of your work has been so rooted in our culture and our history. But was this a conscious choice? Um, and what do you see as the future to setting more reference points for the people to come after us? Sharanya, would you like to dive into that question? Is it that, sorry, uh, is it that telling South Asian stories as a point of focus? Is that it? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I kind of had lag. Well, for me, it's quite natural because I live here and <laughs> roam here. So, you know, also, um, like globally, it does become a kind of, I mean, writing for the international, whatever, global uh, food writing world, which literally means American and British. It does not mean global. Because when they're, th when they're saying, like, global, it just means, like, industry is produced there for there. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's so much as, like, a mode of, like, defiance that I have that we are, I have to, like, insert South Asian stories in. For me, the nature of South Asian stories, because also they come from the American Indian diaspora quite often, tend to be, like quite similar um, or like kind of heterogeneous and South Asians are of all kinds obviously all people are of all kinds but especially there's two billion of us here you know like there are a lot of temperaments so for me to kind of diversify that temperamental mode of storytelling and you know I, I kind of also want to respond to what Archana said this I've seen this happen a lot I don't think that field work is more important than domestic writing at all and I've been reading so much at domestic writing and you know cookie writing but cooking it's really hard and like is really uh, like beautiful and you know so I've seen online that people will pit me and a person that writes co about cooking against each other they'll they'll be like both you know because they'll they'll be like she's a South Asian woman that writes about like the outside and she writes about you know and like we'll, we'll be pitted as competitors which is really unfair and just really ridiculous because like everybody all of these modes are from the subcontinent so and I feel like we're a really diverse people our migrations are really diverse are kind of like I mean, everything is just kind of chaotic and mad and fun to tell about. So, yeah, for me, and as an editor at Whittles, it's like really important that I kind of bring in non-Western, what apparently they call non-Western Europe, North America, non-Wiener, <laughs> which is ridiculous, perspectives. Um, only because that it tells us also about like cultures like our own, like, you know, like the Arab world and other parts that go through similar things that we do here. So, yeah, I don't know that answers. Krish, would you like to come in on the... I think well, just one quick thing that uh, India has famously not been um, very interested in writing things down. We, you know, so, you know, we essentially, we have a history where the Vedas were transmitted for thousands of years purely orally without writing them down, right? And uh, to the point of, you know, um, Archana's point about, you know, cookbooks and so on, you'd be surprised 
if you just go back 200 years, single digit number of cookbooks you can find in all of India. It's just, it's just, there's no writing. Everyone will keep quoting the same Manasolasa, uh, Chalukyan King, 12th century, you know, that, that one recipe that is there about uh, deep fried rat in ghee, right? There is that one famous recipe and that everyone, every time you think about ancient Indian food, Manasolasa will be cited, right? Um, and it's, even if you kind of go back, of course, there are Ayurvedic texts, but they're not really cookbooks. They're really food as medicine related, sort of wellness related things. Um, so in general, data and information seems to be, always, there's always a shortage, right? But we kind of know exactly what recipe a Sumerian baker used uh, in 2500 BC because they wrote stuff down and we didn't write stuff down, right? The other thing also is that uh, cooking is something seen as a, as something that the woman of the house does and until maybe my grandmother's generation, no access to literacy, there's little or no writing about home cooking at all. Royal kitchens, Mughal kitchens, yes, of course, right? Of course, it's good. Now we know that actually Shah Jahan enjoyed paneer biryani. Okay? For all those who think veg biryani is not a thing, the Mughal emperor enjoyed veg biryani, F FYI, okay? But my point is that, um, and even more so, data collection itself is very, very weak. It's, you have to go look at the, you know, our, our family welfare data to find out like number of calories consumed by state, by person, by district, and so on. It is, so in general, I think that rigor of that, I hope, I think going forward, that people take data and collection uh, more seriously. People write down stuff, uh, document whatever they have, just put, a, uh, just put a microphone, you know, to your grandmother, record their recipes, don't have to write it down. We'll have AI transcribe all of that later. Just record stuff. I think, you know, it's important because all of that data will become very, very useful in the next 50, 100 years. I'm going to start with a bit of a long-winded introduction. My relationship with food is not the most intuitive one. I actually fell in love with food because I love science. So I'm a science teacher and um, I learned to cook because I had to feed myself. But then I also like learned to express my love to people in my family, my friends and all through food. But the thing is, um, I actually started following you guys on social media during the pandemic. I learned a lot of recipes from Thomas's Instagram thing. Um, used a lot of my own homegrown mangoes for the various recipes I could find. And um, that's when my grandmom and I really connected. I lost her in 2021. And I lost my love for food, like cooking food somewhere along the way. Um, but Social media has made food and food writing and storytelling so accessible to people, but it's also made that comment section so accessible to people. So the question here that I'm trying to arrive at is, everyone in their own sense is a food expert. And like, you know, with my teaching experience, I've started teaching this thing called theory of knowledge and the question of who owns knowledge. And you're gonna have all these people coming into the comment sections you know, with their own knowledge that they have access to through their cultural exposure, through their work exposure, whatever their biases might be as well. How do you navigate those spaces where someone, you know, gets a bit nasty in your comment section and tries to show off that they know more about food than the average person in that comment section whose knowledge is also just as valid, but they may not have the language to justify it? I would actually say thermistic. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it crisp. Right? So essentially, my my uh, having been on social media since 2007, uh, I can only tell you that the uh, the single biggest mental health trick to deal with social media is to never read the comment section. Uh, but to be fair, uh, I think there is a way to approach comments in a way that uh, if you if you come at it with the fact that people sometimes get emotional about food, food is part of their identity, they get angry when they're assumptions are challenged. So if you give them that benefit of doubt and you sort of just mentally just filter out the nastiness and then see if there's actually, if they're telling you something that is worth learning, right? If there's something constructive, you take it, you leave it and, and then you just, my other thing is that after, I usually mute, at least on Twitter, my, this thing is that after 10 retweets, I mute all conversations because there's no constructive things uh, that come on 24 hours after. So I, I, having worked with social media, I know that generally these algorithms will bring people who agree with you in the first 24 hours, and then they'll bring people who hate you the next 24 hours. That's what engagement is, right? So they want to maximize engagement. So they bring all the haters later. So if you can know that, you just tune out a few hours later, you'll miss all the haters. 
I think so that's essentially how you deal with it. But but in general, yeah, it's it's good to try and see if you can find something constructive. And you also know that social media is famously not designed for nuance, right? I mean, I, I sometimes you know it's interesting. Um, in a I can only write 233 words in a reel, Instagram reel, uh, but I can write quite a lot of words in a comment. So I use the comment section sometimes to explain all the things that I did not include, right? But by the way, you know, um, I, I don't hate vegans and so on. So I have to explain <laughs> all of those uh, kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. um, on Just on that thread, actually, um, Archana, I think it was very interesting when we were talking about uh, recording recipes and going... We were talking about online, but offline as well, in terms of uh, all of these recipes uh, change so rapidly in different households, and then we sometimes club them under certain cuisines. Um, how do you kind of navigate through uh, saying, okay, this is the food of this region, or how do you think people, uh, yeah, I think even with your cookbook, Five Morsels, what was the response like, and what was that like uh, in terms of sharing your family's recipes with people um yeah i guess people get very territorial when you know when you bring recipes into the picture um see my grandmother lived in andhra and Tel what is telangana now so already you know i i shy away from you know talking about my recipes or andhra because somebody will come and say oh, no 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 this is made in telangana and it, it really doesn't matter to me uh, at a certain level um and you know, when I speak about five mussels, I, I really just talk about them as recipes I grew up on and recipes my grandmother cooked. And I say it's from southeastern India, just sometimes to not get into this Andhra Telangana unnecessary, you know, it's 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 a debate that's not going to go anywhere and it's useless. Um, and I also remember when the book came out, uh, people were very curious to know where I grew up. So I grew up in Karnul, which is a part of Rayalseema, which is an, in Andhra. Um, and they're like, you know, you're in the right moment in history of writing about micro cuisines in India. And I'm like, you know, I wrote this book for 10 years. And obviously, when I started writing about it, I had no vision that in 10 years, micro cuisines will be having a moment. Uh, and micro cookbooks which talk about your micro cuisines will be having a moment. So that's not what I was chasing or going after. or I was not being led by the market to go a particular way. Uh, I just really wanted to document the recipes to be very honest, very selfishly, just for myself. Um, and uh, and the beauty of this is, like, even my own friends from the same town I grew up in, uh, no two homes have similar recipes. I mean, broadly, you may still call Guti Vankaya, which is the stuffed eggplant, uh, and which is a very common dish from Andhra. Uh, but, you know, no two households will have the exact same recipe. Um, so it's, um, and I also remember this review which came out in Mint about my new book, uh, Why Cook. Um, it said, uh, you know, these recipes, there's, there's a distinction between heirloom and heritage. And, you know, you these tags to me are a little bit um, not necessary. Like, you know, as long as the recipes are alive, as long as the recipes uh, make us live better, uh, the tags are... You know, I'm, I don't consider myself as a documenter of regional Indian cuisine. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's recipes from where I am from, and I love them, and I document them. Um, and it's probably, that's that's what drives my work, uh, that they're alive, and I, I would like to see them alive in, you know, in maybe a hundred years, if we still exist. Uh, but yeah. I, I, I don't approach it from a, oh, I want to make this other regional cookbook uh, or I want to go after this lesser known region of India. That's that's not the approach, at least I, I take. I just want to add, um, I'm, I, I've always wanted to kickstart a petition to remove the word authentic from the Indian, I mean, food writing vocabulary. So whoever wants to sign up. <laughs> Hi, um, I just had a quick question. I was wondering if, uh, this is a question for any one of you, if any of you have ever navigated um, or felt uncomfortable about the language that you choose to write in and the fact that 
we're capturing uh, our stories and our identity it, primarily in English to begin with, and whether that's something you've um, ever debated with yourself about, you know, and how you kind of land on the fact that, yeah, I choose to write in English, but this comes from the fact that I try to write my grandmom's stories, and there are words like machfuron, which I can't translate, and I don't find a word for in English. How do I navigate that, and if you guys have any advice? So, um, Yamini and I again have this conversation all the time, um, and it's definitely something we want to explore of bringing in other languages uh, to the Lokovo. Um, just, I mean, we, we in fact just discussed, we're both Malayali, and uh, there's a word called kaiponium, which there's, I, I mean, I don't think there's an English translation for that, but also about in going back to what we discussed about the stories we're telling and whose stories they are, and um, I think it's really important to explore other languages um, when you're looking at, especially storytelling that's rooted in, a, in the context of some local place. Just one small anecdote. I think I'm reminded of this uh, uh, recent anecdote by a Thai chef um, who pointed out that um, in, in the Thai language, you don't really say, I don't like this when you, when you eat something, when you eat some new food. Um, what you say is that I don't know how to eat this. Right? So in a sense that I think you know, sometimes language not just encodes semantic meanings that you might not have. Like punch foreign, you know, it's, it's a way of saying that it's like five spices. Yeah, that's fine. It's a more literal this thing, right? But expressions like this get completely lost in translation when you really don't have a way of expressing that sentiment, right? And you literally, trans sometimes you'll translate that as, I don't like it. But that the original Thai expression is, I don't know how to eat it, which is a completely different thing, right? It's more open, right? So you are, you're never saying something is nasty. It's, hey, I, I don't know how to eat it, right? I don't know how to enjoy it, right? So yeah, absolutely, language is crucial. And I think editorially, sorry, am I intruding? No. No, I think editorially, you know, it's really important. So I don't, like I report in um, Hindi usually. And then or when I'm in Rajasthan, it was a lot of Marwari and like Hindi and everything mixed. In Kashmir, it's another like version of the language that I speak. So what I think editors are really important. And I know because Yamini is there. Also, one of the reasons I don't remember that Millet's piece is because editors take a piece and make it their own in a way that is so crucial. And I feel like we have to, you know, really validate that. So um, so what I try to do is not translate entirely in first drafts. Uh, and I put the text like side by side. And oftentimes it always gets converted. So if, I write, if I'm writing for an American publication, they'll always kind of translate it. But I need to know how it's happening. Um, but at Wittles, we keep, um, we keep the other language intact. Uh, for about like 15 to 20 percent of the text which is already you know a, a fair amount for a british publication and i want to do it even more actually or do like both languages side by side and we even have like some i uh, the last season i edited i was working with writers who wanted to write in punjabi so i'd like tell them to write in latin script because i can't read gurmukhi but i can like speak some punjabi so we'd like work together to kind of translate a close version it's a lot of work and i think it's so important and you know, there's like something I reminded of. I wrote a piece about tandoori momo in Delhi. And I just did not know how to translate anything anyone is saying about this thing into English because we're just talking in Delhi Hindi, which is fairly aggressive and like awful. And, you know, so there was this word that, I don't know, am I allowed to swear on this panel? So it says, uh, so the word is bakchodi, which is like just Delhi for like messing around, you know, but it's like, it's it's a bad word. I mean, it's 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 not a great word. So um, Jonathan, who was my editor at the time, was my colleague at Wittles, had no idea how to translate it. So we just decided not to translate it. But it makes sense. So you just kind of, I feel like if you put words in other languages just through a text, they breathe and they come through. Um, and I wish we did more of that, actually. Crucial question. Um, if I may just add to what Sharanya said. You know, in my first book, Five Awesomes of Love, I, I tried doing a lot of this this translation business. And words which I couldn't translate, I put them in italics and things like that. But, you know, at, at some point I had this, you know, this thing of why am I othering my own language? If there was a Telugu word in five morsels, I, it's still in italics. I haven't gone and, you know, re-edited it for a future edition. Uh, but by the time I, you know, started writing Why Cook, the journey made me realize that it's okay to put in words. You don't need to translate Panjaporan. You don't need to translate every single Indian word. 
Um, and I removed the italics rule for my, you know, I'm independently published, so I can do what I want with my work at a certain level. Uh, so nobody's telling me you have to italicize this or not italicize this, you know, simple choices like that. Um, I think it's important to somehow retain, um, you know, retain things on, in our own languages. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, uh, so I wanted, because we were talking about authenticity, uh, I wanted to ask, are there questions of gender and caste that you grapple with? Uh, I know personal narratives are a way to get around it, but, um, you know, are there still questions that you need to gloss over, that you need to grapple with? Anya, do you want to um, wait? Yeah, I mean, these questions are constantly present. And, you know, I feel like food writing has a long way to go to diversify in terms of um, uh, hierarchies. And, I mean, I grapple with it quite, like, really often, especially in Rajasthan. Um, I was reporting on uh, what is categorized as a Muslim community, but they're marginalized caste Muslims. And this, in... Like oftentimes in Muslim communities, their caste doesn't get um, registered or, you know, or never gets like spoken about. So, yeah, it is something that I think that has to be done really um, quite constantly. And um, yeah, and I mean, the only way to also do it is to really to let people from the stories, from the communities tell their stories themselves as well, right? Like, which is happening now. Um, I don't know if it's happening to full effect and there's a lot, long way to go. But um yeah, I mean, like when I also when I was doing work in Kashmir, I was very cognizant of the fact that this is not essentially I'm like a part of a neo-colonial agenda there from the capital. So you know, like all of that stuff is is tricky, and um, I'm not saying like I I don't know if there are like solutions, um, but and for this I I do believe that work needs to be open to critique from readers, and sometimes I feel like people and critique is hard, and you know, but like. I try to listen to it. Like I'm not trying to be noble or something, but I do think that critique needs to come through and like inform the work so it grows. So if I do my second thing in Kashmir, it won't be, you know, it like will try and move from the first errors that I made. Um, I don't know. Sorry, yeah. an answer the question. Like a food science perspective as well. How does how have you like navigated around this conversation of oh, what are you grappling with when it comes to gender and caste? It's it's interesting because I think you can. Um, particularly when it comes to caste and so on, right? Um, you can sometimes use the neutrality of the language of science to kind of shine a light upon certain phrases and words that we just take for granted and ask people to interrogate that a little bit further, right? And sometimes this is all over us, right? I mean, who among us hasn't seen a restaurant with the word pure in its name? Why, I mean, which part of the world do restaurants have the term is pure, right? I mean, are there like impure restaurants? So, so you're, you really ask, why is that word pure there? And then the other one is high class. I mean, you know, so basically in the 1960s, there's a photo of my father standing in front of a restaurant in, uh, uh, in, in, um, in, in Tirnal Valley in 1960s. And it says, uh, Gomati Vilas Brahmanal Coffee House. So, I mean, they, they were just pretty direct then is that those words have now become high class. Like they, they stopped using that word, they used high class now, right? And, and so the thing is that, um, and the other interesting thing always is that, forget all of that, pure and high class still only restaurants. We use the term non-veg. Only part of the world that uses the word non-veg. The food preferences of the majority are described in terms of what a minority does not eat. So the first time, actually I was, I was in a wedding in Trivandrum, um, they had two counters, the reception, they had a, they had a vegetarian and regular. <laughs> so in a sense, I think, you know, sometimes uh, it's okay. I, I'm not like saying that people who say non-veg, no, no, you're being cast. No, I'm just saying that there's a way for you to maybe just, just step back and shine a different light upon the words you use and the phrases you use um, and the way you describe the way you do it. Oh, you know, we don't use these ingredients and so on. So th those, those kinds of things you hear in some, a lot of these YouTube recipes and so on, right? I think it's, you know, where some ingredients are considered impure, right? And, and this is not just meat, right? Garlic and onion, for example, right? So you, I think all of these things have these, the baggage that we don't want to use that word, but we, it's still there, right? And I think it's good to interrogate it from the side rather than head on, which I think sometimes harder for people to uh, deal with. 
Okay. And sorry, I just also like the idea of like normativity is always kind of, you know, cast stone where it's like, this is what everybody eats or this is what, and this always happens like the kind of, in India it's always marketed in terms of it's like luxurious kind of foods and uh, not putting, like not taking into account that that's really what dominant caste, quite endowed communities eat across the country. And, um, you know, these networks are quite, uh, I mean, strong and I feel like food writing and all writing does grapple with them and should even if it's hard work so hope we do thank you for that um, unfortunately that's all about the time we have for this conversation today uh, but thank you so much uh, to our panelists and to the audience for your time uh, to have this conversation about food I think as we said it's it's a nascent space but um, it's growing in all sorts of wonderful directions and is open to all kinds of narratives and newer thoughts and ideas. Um, and as Arshana said, a recipe uh, can change um, existence. Uh, the way we write and talk about food can change political, cultural, and narrative lenses. Um, and yeah, I think this is grounds for excitement, for change, and for the future. So thank you very much again for your time. Thank you to IHS and City Scripts for the opportunity. Thank you. And thank you to Elizabeth for being such a great moderator.